like, what? All right, ready? You are the 
God who saves us, you're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Why don't you turn around and greet someone this morning real quick? I'd like to read this morning Psalms 103. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities? Who healeth all thy diseases? Who redeemeth thy life from destruction? Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies? Who satisfy thy mouth with good things? so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. And Psalms 30, 11, 12 says, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosened my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, that my soul may sing to you, O Lord, and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Let's continue and give thanks to you now. Bless the Lord, all my soul, all my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, all my soul, I worship Your holy The sun comes up, it's a new day dawn. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Sing it out, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name, and on that strength is failing the end draws 
listening and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. God, I worship your holy Your 
praise will ever be on my lips. Oh, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be. Lord, we give you praise this morning. We thank you for your mercies and your loving kindness to us, Lord. We thank you for your healing powers. We thank you for your arms that wrap around us, Lord. And I pray that we wake up every day with praise on our lips, whether it's a good time or a bad morning, Lord, still. If nothing else, call upon the name of Jesus and give praise to him. And Lord, I pray that we praise you every day and that it's always on our lips. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Hey, Tana. all of you this morning. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, and it's great to have you all here today. Hey, did everybody that came in this morning get one of these little uh, pieces of paper? If you did not, Tana's got them for you. Great, because you're not going to have a PowerPoint this morning. I wound up, uh, I wound up spending the bulk of this week down in, uh, in Orange County. Becky and I actually had two wonderful days on Coronado Island, and then, uh, and then I had some meetings in Orange County. And um, anyway, I got home, I got back from DIA, I landed at nine o'clock last night. I never got a PowerPoint together, but I got this together. So it'll just have to do today. But um, today we're gonna talk about a really important topic. So I was reading my quiet time back on Monday in Colossians chapter four, verse six, where Paul says, let your conversation always be full of grace seasoned with salt, that you might be able to give an answer to everyone. And it was that first part of the phrase that hit me, let your conversation be always filled with grace. And so as I was thinking about that passage and kind of reflecting back on my own life and all the years of being a leader in ministry and serving as a pastor, serving on mission boards, um, I've had to say a lot of things that ultimately hurt a lot of people along the way. And so I started making a list of the people I've hurt and uh, with my words. And I remember back to the very first church I was in, young pastor in my 20s, and um, I became a pastor, a lead pastor when I was 21 years old. I didn't have any idea what I was doing. But at any rate, there was a couple that started coming to our church, and anyway, they, they, they disappeared for three weeks. And I was worried about them, and so I jumped in my car after the service, and as I was driving on, on, on home after church, I drove by their house, and he was out mowing the lawn. And I, I can remember stopping my car, and I walked up to him, and I remember it was like it was yesterday. I, I don't know what came over me, but I lit into the guy. And I was like, this is ridiculous. And I said, you know, how come you weren't in church, and you're mowing your lawn? And anyway, I laced into him, and it was really, really dumb. And I wound up having to apologize to him profusely, but you know, sometimes the toothpaste gets out of the tube and it's really hard to put it back in. <laughs> and you know, he never came back to church. His wife never came back to church. <clears throat> and, and for the life of me, I don't know. You know, I don't know if they're still walking with God or not. But I look back and I think, you know, I bet they had the opportunity over the years to tell a lot of people about that crazy pastor who said something so hurtful to them. Now, there have been other times when I've said things that, you know, I, I didn't mean to hurt somebody, but I had to say something really, really hard. And it was necessary. And, you know, as a, as a Christian leader, uh, both as a pastor and as a CEO of a mission agency, I've had to fire people. And I don't like firing people. It's really, really hard because you've got to say really hard things. And I don't want to hurt people, but I know that I have to say these things but to say them in a way that is, that is constructive and helpful is really difficult. And I'm thankful because in some cases it turned out real good. I was driving along in a van with a guy one time in Thailand 
And uh, we're driving along together, and there's another lady in the car, and the lady in the car knew the other guy that was in the van, and, and she said, well, who is this guy? And, he's, and he introduced me, and she said, well, isn't that the guy that fired you? And, um, and he said, yeah, he is the guy that fired him, but we're really good friends. And I realized, okay, chalk that one down for a win. That one worked out. But there have been plenty of other times, although I fired another guy, and he still calls me on Father's Day, which is kind of odd, but... Uh, bottom line is, a lot of the times, um, I've had to say really, really hard things, and I don't intentionally want to hurt the person, but my words offended them and brought hurt into their lives. So I started making a list of, you know, who have I offended over the years? And I thought it would be good to kind of get that list in front of me just to see if there's anything I need to do to, you know, to address some of those things. And I started making a list, and I was feeling pretty good about myself early in the week because I felt like, wow, I guess I patched up pretty much most of these things, and I was feeling pretty good about it, and then I got a phone call on Friday. And I was at a church in Irvine, and I parked my car, and I was walking towards the front of the church, and all of a sudden my phone rings, I look down, and there's a blast from the past on my phone. And I, 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 I said, hi, and she said, hi, and she said, do you have time to talk? That's never a good thing. <laughs> um, and so, well, for you, of course I do, and so anyway, she wound up telling me that she had harbored bitterness in her heart for three years. I mean, she had ghosted my wife and I. We had, we'd, we'd, we'd written her numerous emails, nothing coming back. And we wondered, gee, if we offended her, but nothing was coming back. And finally, she, she called, and she said, I just want to apologize. And I said, well, what for? And she said, well, I've been harboring bitterness in my heart towards you. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, but just know I totally forgive you but what are you harboring your bitterness towards me for? And she said, well, you said something that wasn't accurate about my husband in a board meeting. And I, I said, I'm sorry, but I don't remember what that is. Could we talk about that? And she said, I don't want to get into that, uh, but I just know that it really offended me. It really hurt me. And I said, well, I just, I understand you don't want to talk about that. I get it, but just know that I don't want to offend you and I don't know what I said, so I don't really know if it was accurate or not, but either way, whether it was accurate or not, I want to really, really unnecessarily hurting you. And for that, I, I just, I want you to know I'm really, really sorry because I value you guys and I value your friendship. And it was a wonderful a moment there on the phone of just being able to reconcile with somebody that I had frankly not put on my list of people I offended because I had no idea that I had offended them. I wonder about that in your life. Are there people that you have offended? Maybe, maybe you look at it and say, well, it's necessary. I had to say those things. Yeah, maybe you did. Maybe it was unnecessary and you just kind of lit up like I did with the guy that was mowing his lawn, you know? Or maybe it was unintentional. You didn't mean to hurt them, um, and, but you, you did, but you didn't mean to, but you still hurt them, all right? Maybe it was intentional, which is, whoa, you know, you really intentionally meant to hurt me? And sometimes we assume that the other person is intentionally trying to hurt us when really they're not, all right? And maybe, maybe you didn't even know you hurt them. And you just, you know, it just seems like the relationship went cold, but you don't even know how you hurt them. Um, and so it was unknowingly, but somewhere down the line, you hurt them. I think we all go through those things in our lives. And usually it's because of our words. I mean, James, who is kind of like the Solomon of the New Testament, you know, the wise guy, and James wrote, he said, that, he said, the tongue is like a little fire. And he said, all it takes is a little spark to start a giant forest fire. And not about you, but I've seen lots of little sparks that turn into giant forest fires over the years. And some of those things were directly my fault. Now, to be frank with you, I've been on the other side of that too. And I've had people say things about me or to me that I found very offensive. And how have I handled those things? Because, you know, you don't want to get in that place where the writer of Hebrews, when he talked about in Hebrews chapter 12, he said, beware lest a root of bitterness spring up and corrupt the body. And the word root of bitterness there is the Greek word pikra. It almost sounds sharp, doesn't it? Don't let that sharp thing get in there and create bitterness. Our, our relationships matter with one another. That's why Jesus said, if you come to the church and you're, you came to give, put your gift down, and, you know, and if you realize you've offended somebody, go and make it right, and then give your gift. Because what's more important to God is not the gift you bring, 
but the relationships that you have. So what about you? Have, have your words always been seasoned with grace? And have they resulted, whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether necessary or unnecessary, whether knowingly or unknowingly, brought offense in a person's, another person's life? And if so, what steps might God have you take to make those things right? So what I want to share with you this morning, you've got that little piece of paper in front of you. I want us to look at the book of Proverbs. And there's a lot of verses here, so I'm not going to have you look them up necessarily, but these verses come from the New Living Translation. And this is really, these are kind of rules for engagement. We're always going to have to have tough conversations, crucial conversations. The book was written by that name. We're always going to have to engage in things that are going to be difficult. The question is, how do we do it? What are the rules of engagement for navigating those kinds of conversations? So here's the 10, 10 rules, 10 commandments, if you will. And these are kind of the rules of engagement that I've sought to work with in my life. And I've not done it perfectly, mind you, but I do kind of keep this list in front of me. In fact, my wife and I wrote a book together called Listen Well, Lead Better. Uh, it came out ironically in the very month COVID hit. And the main marketing of this book was in airport kiosks. You know those choice book things? Nobody was flying anymore, so the book was a bust. But anyway, nobody will ever ask me to write again, I'm sure. But um, this comes from that book, all right? These are some of the things that, that after all these years, of, you know, it just feels like so many times in pastoral and ministry leadership, I found myself having to say hard things. I, gosh, I remember, a, I remember a guy, this guy wanted to give two, he wanted to give a quarter million dollars to this project, and, and I, was on the, I was on the board of this organization, and this guy wanted to give a quarter million, but he wanted to go around the rules. He didn't want any assessment taken out. He wanted 100% of that to go to the project that he chose. He didn't want to follow the rules. And the mission agency came to me and they said, we don't know what to do. You're a board member, you do it, you fix it. And I remember calling this guy up and I so, you know, I'm so thankful you want to give a quarter million dollars, what a generous heart you have. But oh, by the way, you can't break the rules. And I realized that in that conversation, I offended that guy. Um, he figured out another way to give his quarter million dollars, but it wasn't through the organization. All right, so it just seems like I have had to have a lot of those in my life. And sometimes I do them well, and sometimes I don't. My guess is sometimes you do them well, and sometimes you don't as well. So here's 10 commandments, ready? Here we go. We're gonna go through pretty quick. Number one, no demeaning. Finger pointing, you know, wagging your finger, rolling your eyes, name calling. We are now in the political season, and the political debates are on. And it's always amusing to watch these things. I remember going all the way back to Reagan and Carter and watching the presidential debate way back then, and Reagan rolled his eyes. And in that moment, I thought, you know what? I like this guy, and I like where he's coming from. By the way, I voted Reagan. My wife voted Carter. We, you know, neutralized one another. But I thought to myself, I, I like this guy, but I don't like that. But that's nothing compared to today. Today you watch the presidential debates and people call each other names. They wag their bony fingers in one another's faces. They call each other liars. I was watching a debate the other day and it was bits and pieces of the debates from Brazil. I was wondering if they're any better at it down there than we are in the States, and they're not. And I saw a debate in Taiwan where they actually wound up Fisting one another. I mean, how's that happen? You know? Um, no demeaning. Why? Because Proverbs 14, 21 says, it is a sin to belittle your neighbor. You call him a name, you roll your eyes, you wag your finger, you try to humiliate him. That's sinful. All right? Okay, number two. No losing your cool or raising your voice. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. I always know the pattern of my life. If I'm in a really tense meeting, and I've been in lots of tense meetings, I was in a, I was in a meeting where the chairman of the board was a lawyer, he was a prosecutor, and he, he was used to treating the church boardroom like the courtroom. 
And in a courtroom, you, you, your lawyers get in really fierce fights with one another, and then everybody goes out for pie. And that's the way our board was. So we'd be at a board meeting where he'd be yelling at people and saying, you're nothing but a bold-faced liar. I mean, it's a church board meeting, and he's yelling at people like this. And then everybody goes out to Village Inn afterwards, and it was like, I don't get it. I, I don't know how this works. Um, and I found for me that what happened was when he talked that way, I started to talk that way. And the next thing you know, it's almost like there's an all-out verbal brawl. But I could find in my own, I could find what was happening with me because my earlobes started getting red and they would get hot and I could feel the heat. And that's how I knew I'm about ready to blow it. All right, and so I've had to learn to temper, you know, to calm my temper. And I think I've got a pretty good handle on it. But I remember pretty clearly there were three times in my life where I literally was in a meeting and I got so upset, I slammed my fist on the table. In fact, one time I slammed my fist on the table and it hurt so bad I almost busted my finger. And then I told the guy, you don't change and you're fired. That wasn't good, by the way. <laughs> That's the guy that still calls me on Father's Day, however, which is amazing. No losing your cool or raising your voice. Okay, number three. No snarkiness. I don't even know what snarkiness was. It just sounds like a bad word, but I looked it up in the dictionary to figure out what it means. It means to mock under your breath. So you say something that's just kind of eh, sarcastic, you know, well, you get it, snarky. Don't do that, and don't engage in profanity. You know, I love that verse in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. And Paul there, he tells us that our words are to be for the building up of one another constructive. And he says, do not let any unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. I've been kind of amazed how lately in Christian circles, people just seem more comfortable with profanity. Have you noticed that or is it just me? I mean, I remember growing up, you, you just, there were words you just did not say. I mean, my mom literally took a bar of soap and put it in my mouth when I said a cuss word. You know, and she said, I got to wash your mouth out with soap. That was not a happy thing. And I learned very early on, there's a list of words you do not say. But now everybody feels totally freedom to say whatever they feel. And they, it's almost like they don't care anymore. They talk about how our culture, our, our whole culture is now, civil, civil discourse is now coarse, right? I mean, people feel free to just throw profanity around. That's not, that's not good, and it's not becoming of a follower of Jesus. I've seen Christians using profanity on Facebook. It's like, why would you do that? You know, why, 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 what's the point of that? Look, the, our, our conversation, the way we talk to one another is to be always filled with grace. So none of this snarkiness, sarcasm, profanity. Watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. Good advice. Okay, number four. No misrepresentations. Half-truths or exaggerations. You know, somebody once said to me, Steve, never say never, all right? Because whenever you use the word never or always, that's an exaggeration. Nothing's never and nothing's always. And when you use those, you know, you always or you never, yeah, that's an exaggeration. And then half-truths. Isn't it amazing how in this political season people pull out a little sound bite that somebody said and they blow it up in this big thing and they say, this is where this guy stands. It's like, really? You don't know where he stands? You took it out of contest, context and you twisted it around to make a whole big deal out of it. That's not truth. And yet it's everywhere. People are not trafficking in truth anymore. Your words can be twisted and taken out of context and bent into something you never even imagined, you never even thought. And somehow people feel a liberty to do that to one another. That is not the way of the body of Christ. We don't traffic in half-truths. We don't misrepresent people. We don't exaggerate. Um, we're very guarded with those kinds of things because telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an ax. Well, I didn't know there was an ax murderer in the Bible, all right? But that's what you're doing. You're hitting somebody with an ax when you, when you lie, when you, when you tell half-truths. Paul said in Ephesians 4.25, um, he tells us there, um, what was his, his exact words, were something along the lines, and do not lie to one another. And that includes all those things, half-truths, misrepresentations, deceptions, 
You name it. Okay, the next one. Are right, you filling the blank on this one? What do you think the word is? No blank the beans to those who don't need to know. Spilling the beans. You don't need to spill the beans. Now, we all want people to be on our side, right? I got in a mega church conflict one time. I mean, this was the stuff people write books about. So the chairman of the board and I, we were on opposite poles on everything. You know, we, were, we lived on different planets. We didn't agree on leadership, worship, preaching styles, nothing were we in agreement on. And I remember the first board meeting at this church. I'd been called as a pastor, and he'd been voted in as the chairman of the board. We were both new to our roles. And the very first board meeting, uh, I'm sitting there with our 15 elders, and he stands up at the end of the table. And he says, Pastor Harling, I came to the Lord in this church 30 years ago. It's the only church I've ever known. And pastors will come and go, and I'm going to be here a long time after you're gone. Holy smokes, that was a shot across the bow. Don't ever do that if you're an elder. So right then I knew this is gonna be outwit, outlast, outplay, and seriously, it's exactly what it was. It was the most brutal thing ever. And so what happened is, you know, uh, the rest of the board came to me at one point, and they said, you gotta hire a lawyer. And I says, what is this? I'm not gonna sue the guy. I mean, they can't do that. And so we were at total odds, and he probably had 1,000 people in the church on his side, and I probably had 1,000 on my side. And then there were two or 3,000 that were in the middle zone. And I'd get up to preach on Sunday morning, and I'd be looking at the congregation, Leonard, who's with me? Who's against me? Who's with, who's with him? Who's with me? That's not good for preaching, by the way, because you start hating people, and you start, it's just not good. Um, and anyway, it just turned to this wild, doggy dog. I mean, this is a stuff, this is unbelievable stuff. And, but it was, it was bad because both of us, we needed to build our cadre of defenders, okay? So I had my guys that I'd go out and I'd say, you, I can't believe what this guy's doing. You can't believe what he's saying. Unbelievable stuff. And, and, you know, I need you to know me. I need you to have my back. And then I'd go to the next guy, and I need you to have my back. And, you know, I need you to have my back. And, you know, so I had my little group, but he was out doing the same thing. And he had his little group. And I'd go between services on Sunday morning between, because there were four different services, and I'd be going from one venue across the courtyard to the next. And between the services, there was, he'd have his little cadre out there with a little sign-up sheet. And the little sign-up sheet was, uh, you know, to recall the pastor. All right, so I'd be running between services, and it was the kind of thing where I'd I'd preach in one service, and it was <laughs> we had the contemporary and traditional thing, right? So I'd do the contemporary preaching jeans, quickly run into the green room, throw on a suit, and then run over to that one. And as soon as I was done preaching here, they were doing worship over there while the preaching was happening here, and then I get up and preach there, and I had to time the thing literally to seconds so that I showed up on time. You can never go over time in that kind of a scenario. And then I run back from there, run across the courtyard, strip down to jeans again, start all over there, and then turn around, throw a suit on again, and go back. I mean, it was nutty. It was crazy making. I was crazy. Um, but in between, as I'm running around the courtyard, here's this guy's this little sign-up sheet, you know, a recall from the pastor. That doesn't make for good preaching either. <laughs> but the thing of it is, both of us wound up getting our cadre on our side. And we said things about one another that weren't good. And maybe it was true. Maybe it wasn't true. But in the end, we wound up dividing the church. And both of us became lightning rods. And I remember when the board finally stood up and said, enough already, and they, 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 they decided they were going to dismiss the chairman of the board and at the same time, they were looking at me and saying, Steve, you're such a lightning rod now. We don't know how you can shepherd our people anymore. And I wound up, uh, I wound up stepping down a couple months later. And, I, you know, I'll never know. Did I do the right thing stepping down? Should I have stayed? I don't know. I, I, that's one of those things that's in God's hand. Here's what I do know. I hated church. And I hated God's people. And I had become party to this thing where we, we, we just talk and talk and talk and talk. And if I've seen this once, I've seen this many times. 
Churches are kind of like that. I mean, we're like this extended family. We all talk to one another. We want to get people on our side because we need them to have our back or we need them to understand us. And we're afraid that if they hear something about us that's not good, they might get the wrong message. So therefore, we're going to get our message out and we're going to get it out first. And it's just this crazy making. Don't spill the beans to people that don't need to know. All right? Okay, here's the next one. All right, let's see if anybody can get number six. No uh, blank, monopolizing the conversation. This is a tough one. Who can come up with that word? Here's a context for you. You're in the, uh, you're in the Senate, and a bill is on the table, and half the, half the party, uh, half of the people in the Senate don't want it to pass, so what do they do? Filibuster. So you got some clown, he gets up there, he doesn't want to see this bill pass, so he stands up and he starts telling the story of Jack and the Beanstalk. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous what happens in our political world sometimes, but that happens, interestingly, in, when it comes to difficult conversations. You get so nervous that you just start running on and on and on and on, and you don't come up from the air. And then finally, when, you, when you're stopped, the person says, is that all, you know? And they never had a chance to say anything themselves. That's filibustering, all right? Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Well, that doesn't mean there aren't things you need to say, but don't monopolize the conversation. Come up for air and ask questions like, how are you experiencing me right now? That's a tough one, you know? Um, what, what is your perspective on that? You know, this is what I'm sensing, but I want to know what you're sensing. Um, make it a conversation that is always with grace. Okay, number seven, no assuming sinful motivations or intentions. Why? Because if you search for good, you'll find favor, but if you search for evil, it'll find you. It's really easy to assume the worst about people. You know, when, you, when you're going into a difficult conversation, and it's just kind of like, you know, you put people in a box, and it's like, I know this is the way they're going to act. This is the way they're going to respond. I'm predicting it in my mind. And sure enough, it turns out the way I thought it was going to be. And so you had this kind of prescribed box. of This is the way I perceive their behavior is going to come down. And you don't let them out of the box. But it's kind of like, remember we were, when we were in the Gospel of John, we just finished that series, but in John chapter 5, remember the lame man? And how the disciples were, went to Jesus and they said, what caused this man to be lame? Who sinned, him or his parents? Remember that? What were they doing? They were assuming someone sinned. And we do that with one another a lot. We assume evil intent. We assume sin on the part of the other person. And maybe there is, but maybe there's not. When do you give the benefit of the doubt? And even if you're wrong, you're given the benefit of the doubt. Assume the best about the other person, not the worst. Go into every difficult conversation, assuming that that person has some valid reasons behind what they're saying. And that even though they may have, there may be some questionable things part of that, on the other hand, look at, look at the value. I had to go through that and that really tough thing with that chairman of the board. And I realized that that chairman of the board, he was trying to protect the heritage of the church. And that's not a bad thing. I'm a change agent. I came in, had this big vision, um, 7,000 people on the campus, $30 million building, 12 different worship venues happening in all these different languages. And he's coming in. He's the chairman of the board. He's going to protect the heritage of the church. And here's this new rabble rouser shows up trying to change everything. His intentions were not all evil. And I had to kind of push pause on viewing him as this sinful, demonic guy that was out to destroy my life. And I had to think, you know, wait a minute, the guy's not all bad. Nobody's all bad. And nobody's all good. Well, I mean, Hitler might be all bad, all right? But nobody's all bad or all good. We're all a mixture. And rather than just assuming the worst about somebody, let's give them a little benefit of the doubt, all right? So there it is. Um, don't assume sinful motivations or intentions. Okay, number, uh, number eight. No shaming or blaming. If you roll a boulder down on others, it'll crush you instead. That's a really good piece of advice. You shame somebody else, watch out, because sooner or later, you're going to be the one that winds up being shamed. You know, I grew up in a boarding school environment. My parents were missionaries. I've told you that before. 
And when I was seven years old, I was sent away to a boarding school, and there were 240 unruly kids trying to be managed by a handful of people that really didn't want to be there as dorm parents because they really went to Africa to plant churches among the nationals. And somebody said, hey, we really need you to be a dorm parent at this school with 240 unruly kids. And so we had these dorm parents, and it was like Lord of the Flies. I mean, it was, it was crazy at times. Because when the dorm parents didn't know what was going on, chaos was breaking loose. And we were doing stuff. I mean, when I was, when I was, when I was 13 years old, me and my buddies would go camping up in the jungle at night in the darkness of the night, and we'd take a roll of toilet paper and we'd put it completely across the road at midnight. And trucks would come barreling up through the mountains and all of a sudden see there's something blocking the way. And they'd park their truck, stop, and then we'd blow off firecrackers in the woods next to them. It was crazy to see the panic and the mayhem. I was 13 years old. It was out of control. We were totally, it was not a good thing. <laughs> but here's the thing about the boarding school. So while you had that little out of control behavior, then you have the behavior on campus. And what the dorm parents, some of them figured out is that you can only use the three foot long rubber strap so much and because we got, we got onto that, we figured that out. So we started taking rubber flip-flops and we whip ourselves on the rear end, taking turns whipping each other to build up calluses. <laughs> so when the real thing happened, it wouldn't destroy us, all right? I don't know why I'm telling you that story. <laughs> and now I've completely lost where I was going. Let me get back to those notes. Oh, yes. I think where they left... <laughs> Where they landed is that the best way to control the behavior of these unruly kids is to embarrass them in front of one another. And I can look vividly back in my mind to some of those moments where I would be called out in front of a great number of other kids and shamed and embarrassed in front of them. And you had kids that were struggling with wetting their bed or kids that were missing mom and dad and crying at night and they would be held up in front of people during lunchtime when 240 kids are eating their lunch and they would be, their names would come on the loudspeaker and things would be said about them to embarrass them into changing their behaviors. And I learned early on that the biggest fear of my life, in fact, Becky asked me this a few years ago. She said, Steve, what is the biggest fear of your life? And honestly, I thought, I don't think I have a lot of fears, but then I thought about it and I realized, I really do. And what I'm afraid of more than anything else is being embarrassed. And I know, looking back, that that was embedded into my psyche. And so I avoid situations where it could result in me being embarrassed or shamed in front of other people. And I don't want to be guilty of doing that with the people I care about. And I don't want us to do it in the context of church. You know, my sister-in-law wound up um, going through a very difficult time where she left her husband and was living on the streets and became an alcoholic. And then in the middle of that, some cult uh, wooed her into their clan. And in that cult, they used shame as their number one behavior modification thing. And it was the, one of the biggest challenges of Becky and my of our lives to figure out how do we get our sister out of the cult. And uh, I don't want to go into that, that incredible story, but Bottom line is that almost is a cultic behavior, to conform people's behavior by shaming them. And I've seen that in church, and we don't want to be about that. Okay, the next one, number nine, no judging or jumping to conclusions, if you will, before the facts are all in. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. Read a, and there's another verse in Proverbs. I had a hard time deciding which one to use on this one because there's another verse in Proverbs that says that when somebody comes into the courtroom and you hear their case, it sounds compelling until the next person comes in and you hear the other side. And I think that there is kind of this tendency that we all have to hear a persuasive argument and then just jump to conclusions about it rather than waiting for all the facts to be on the table. There's a profound tendency that we have to do that. And we do that with one another as well. But what does it look like to just be willing to suspend judgment? Waiting until all the facts are in. Don't jump to conclusions. 
Um, I do that. I, people come to me and they say, you know, so-and-so said such and such, and it was so hurtful, it was so damaging, it was so out of, you know, just inappropriate, and they're so, and I, I tend to buy into that. Oh, yeah, I hear you. That was so bad of them to say that, and, you know, I can't believe that, but I'm, wait, what am I doing? And then I talk to those people, and I get a completely different side, and it's like I don't even know who's, where's the truth here anymore. And I think we just gotta be careful about just jumping to conclusions and taking whatever we hear as gospel truth when we don't have the whole story, all right? And again, that's just good conflict mediation skills. Okay, number 10, here we are. We're gonna wrap this thing up. In fact, you come in with what do you think the word is? No blank in where you don't belong. No butting in, you got it. Don't butt in where you don't belong. Why? Because interfering in someone else's argument is as foolish as yanking on a dog's ears. Now, I can tell you truthfully, I don't remember yanking on a dog's ears um, in my lifetime, but I don't think it would be a good idea. And there's something inside of me. If I see a Doberman pincer that has really cute ears, I don't think I'd walk up and yank on his ears. And what Solomon is telling us here is that's what you're doing when you butt into somebody else's disagreement and you start taking sides with them and you get involved in them and their argument, what are you doing? You, you don't need to be in there. You don't need to be involved. Stay involved in the things you need to be involved in and there, there are times to be involved. There are times when you can help navigate, a, a bring healthy, constructive transformation out of conflict. That's where you ought to be involved. But don't just butt into somebody else's stuff, Okay? Um, because that's what you're doing is you're yanking on a Doberman pincer's ears. All right, so here's the deal. You've got 10 rules of engagement, and this is a pretty good list. It's probably good to pin this on the refrigerator for a while, but here's the thing. It is really easy to see how everybody else has violated these rules. It's a lot harder to figure out how I violated them, right? So we look at other people and we say, oh, yeah, that, one, oh, man, that happened to me, oh, yeah. And we don't realize that we're guilty of the same stuff. I bet you on this list of 10 things, I bet you can find one, maybe, that you violated like this week. All right? What, what, what does it look like to look in the mirror like I did early this week when I started making a list of who have I offended in my life? I don't want to end my life with leaving behind shrapnel of damaged relationships and broken lives. And while I was in Coronado, I'd go into the restaurant. Becky and I were eating in our favorite restaurant, Miguel's in Coronado Island. And, and every time somebody comes in, I'm looking, do I know them? Do I know them? Were they with me? Were they against me when I was out here? Was, and I still run into people when I go to San Diego. And I'm looking in that restaurant, and a guy came in who looked like that guy. Now, all of a sudden, all those weird feelings came back. I thought I'd resolved it. I mean, I remember having a phone conversation with him and he said, he said, if I've offended you, I ask you for your forgiveness. And I said, if you've offended me? <laughs> that wasn't real good. <laughs> but what about you? Where do you see in this list of things? And what would it look like to go to somebody that's close to you, a mentor, Maybe not even a mentor, maybe just somebody else in the church. And say, hey, you know me well enough. Where do you think I violated these 10 rules? Because I want to grow as a follower of Jesus. And I, I see in here that I, I am in error on some of these things. And I, I would like you to tell me, which one of these do you think is my greatest weakness? And how about going to your spouse or go to your kids? And my wife and I have done that with our kids. We've sat down with them with a list like this said, kids, we want your honest feedback. And people sometimes say, why are you so close to your kids? I think it's because we created an environment where they can speak truth to us. And they can say things like, mom and dad, you know, you really hurt me when you said this. Um, and so I think it's really important for us to have those kind of honest conversations. And when you think about somebody else in the body of Christ here, this is a family, we're a family, and we say things to one another. We don't necessarily, we don't mean to hurt each other. We're not out to make somebody's life ruined. But unintentionally, we hurt them. And sometimes we have to say things that are necessary to say, and we just know what we're saying is gonna hurt. And it does, it stings. 
But what can we do after that to restore relationships and, and show our love and support and affection for one another? Even if what you had to say is legit and you had to say it and it was necessary, how you say it matters. And then how you clean up afterwards matters. Because you don't want to leave shrapnel behind you in your wake. Look, we live differently than the world lives. The world doesn't care anymore. I listened on talk radio this week. Some guy out in California was on talk radio and he said, I don't care who I offend anymore. I'm tired of all this. Don't offend. I'm just, I don't care anymore. I'm just going to say what I think. Dude, then don't be on Christian radio. All right? Because we, we don't do that. All right? Our words matter. They're to be seasoned with grace. Are you really, really glad that God doesn't treat you like this? You know how many times I've said stuff like this to God? Believe it or not, I've sworn at God. Really? I've used bad language at God. And the amazing thing is he's still there and he still loves me. And he still comes running to me. And he doesn't write me off. And what happens so often is when somebody in the body of Christ says something to you, there's a violation of this, what do you do? You write them off. You put them in a box. You say, I'm not going to associate with them. I don't want to go anywhere near them. I'm going to come to church and I'm going to go the other way. I'm not going to go anywhere near them because I don't, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to have anything to do with them. Are you glad does, God doesn't do that with us? Let's not do it to each other. There's always room for growth in every one of our lives. We are all a mixture of good and bad. We all have areas where we need to grow. Let's lean into those things and become better people because we want to be like Jesus. First Peter, I close with this. This is a great little text. And Peter tells us these words in 1 Peter chapter 2 at the very end. And for the life of me, I can't find Peter right now. Can you believe that? Is it before Hebrews or after? All right. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He's your example. You must follow in his steps. He never sinned. He never deceived anybody. He never retaliated when he was insulted. He never threatened revenge when he suffered. And he left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. And he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. And by his wounds, you're healed. And once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you've turned to your Savior, the guardian of your souls. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the example of our Savior Jesus, who though he was reviled, he reviled not again. Who though he had opportunities to say mean-spirited things to mean-spirited people, he didn't. Who when he was misrepresented, when people shared half-truths and exaggerations about him, he did not respond in like manner. We thank you for the example of our Savior, his patience, his love, his grace. His words were always full of grace and seasoned with salt. And Lord, we want to be more like Jesus. We want the world around us to look at us and say, wow, those people are so different. They're not like everybody else. They don't demean and humiliate. They don't wag their fingers and look down at people. And when they make mistakes, they go and make them right again. Amazing, they're so different. Lord, that's the kind of people we want to be. We want to be the people that the rest of the world looks to and says, wow, they're amazing in how they treat others. And Lord, we know that every one of us has growth in our lives. We need to grow, and we're going to blow it, and we, we're going to do it sometimes intentionally, but most times unintentionally. Sometimes we're going to do it knowingly, but other times unknowingly. And sometimes we're going to do it, Lord, when it's unnecessary, but other times when it is necessary. But in every case, we pray that our words would be full of grace and that we would be the kind of people who value our relationships with one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I was big.
carry that kind of weight It was my tune Till I met you quick announcements. Uh, don't forget that the Operation Christmas Child is going on. There's boxes out, out in the lobby there. You can grab, fill them up, bring them back. Also, we will be having a prayer meeting this coming Friday night, and then the second Friday of uh, November and the second Friday of December. And that will be from 6.30 to 8. If you come, feel free to come whenever. So you can come at 7, leave at 7.30. You don't have to be here the whole time from 6.30 to 8. Uh, Bill Coomer wanted to make sure y'all know that. So and we have one more announcement from the elders. Good morning. Hey, my, my name is Kurt, and I'm one of the elders here at the church. And uh, how many here know that it's Pastor Appreciation Month? Can I see a... And you all brought cards today, right? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, oh well, there's the rest of the cards. <laughs> so we have you covered if you didn't bring a card. So, uh, Pastor Steve, could you come up here, please? Uh, on behalf of the elders and, and the worship team and the entire church, we just want to really give you a big, heartfelt thanks for all that you do here at the church. Yeah. Thank you. 
I mean, you, uh, you teach us, you challenge us, uh, and your messages just really come across, especially today. Uh, because there's a lot of things on that list I need to work on myself. So, but uh, we have a few a few cards here. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Shelley and and the Thanks, uh, and the staff for uh, for putting some of this stuff together. But uh, enjoy what's in thank there. You. Uh, I, will. I think there may be some gift cards, maybe a little bit of cash and checks. So, oh wow, good. So cool. uh, thanks. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, Steve's been here for at least two years. Oh, it seems uh, like that, doesn't it? He, uh, yeah. he, he uh, filled the, pul the pulpit yeah. after Pastor Joshua and, yeah. and then, uh, you know, right before Matt. And, uh, and then uh, yeah. we called him again. He's, uh, you know, thankfully he, uh, he agreed to, to fill the pulpit again yeah, during this good. transition. So I so appreciate all of you. I really, really do. You know, it's, it's a busy season of our lives. But just knowing, knowing you guys has been such a blessing for me. I wish Becky could be here every week. She's not able to because she serves on a church, on a staff of another church. Um, but I just appreciate all of you so very much. I'll miss you next week. I've got, uh, I'll be speaking at a conference in uh, Phoenix next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then the week after that, I'm actually speaking at a conference in Louisville. So I'll miss you then. But then I will be back in November, I think 11th or something like that. So hopefully you got somebody covering for us during those weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Either that yeah. or you're doing a problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. there has been uh, a Sunday or two where I kind of waited to yeah. the last minute. But, but yes, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we have you covered for, uh, good, good, for good, next good, Sunday. So. Okay, uh, thank you all so very, very much. I appreciate you and love you. Thank yeah. you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, let me close in a word of prayer, and uh, we can uh, get going and, and uh, get on our way home and whatever else we have planned this afternoon. So, dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for guiding us and leading us. I pray, Father, that we would seek you this week with all of our hearts. Uh, work on our lives as far as uh, uh, rules of engagement. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the message today. I just pray, Father, that we'd be a church full of love and encouragement for one another uh, forgive us for the sins that we've uh, we've had in the past and uh, just lead us in the direction that you'd have us to go uh, be with the search team uh, as we're interviewing one more candidate this afternoon and just go with us uh, this day and the rest of the week i pray in jesus name amen have a good sunday thank you <laughs>